You know, shyness has many colors to it. I just thought about it before this video. Like, it's kind of strange to me because in the past, we've done the biggest recording projects ever done in the history of sampling. We've done the biggest symphony orchestra ever done. That was a 240 piece orchestra. We never took any pictures or any videos of it because of our shyness. We did a 200 person choir also in the same ginormous hall of Slin. We actually modified the hall by taking out the chairs to create even more reflection, even though it's a giant hall. But we get about like 3.9 seconds when we really make the hall wet, just to beef up the sound. As you may know, we've done mega ensembles, 66 trombones, 66 cellos, 66 tubas, and 66 basses in the same hall as well. But I've also been thinking about how we could sort of spread the notion of what is an ensemble because everything I've mentioned so far is in the classical realm. So our extreme ensembles is really about breaking that notion of what constitutes an ensemble. And in the video today, we took 10 analog synthesizers in this giant hall and recorded them all with all the traditional waveforms that comes with synthesizers, you know, sine waves and saws and triangles and all that stuff, squares. But for me, the underlying tale behind this story is one about shyness because most of the things I just mentioned, we never recorded them, we never took pictures. When we had the 10 analog synthesizers in the hall, we were too shy to film that as well. And I just want to mention that because for me, sometimes shyness can create lost opportunity. And I guess we just have to enjoy this library for what it sounds like, but it was such a joy and it's something we want to do more of and certainly film the next time as well. Um, because it's so beautiful what happens in a symphonic hall, the way the hall becomes an instrument in itself, the way the eternal amount of waveforms clash into each other and create a whole new ocean of sound that isn't possible with conventional means. But in this video, I guess I also get to maintain my shyness as Dan Shimmy is gonna take over and really go deep into this instrument. He is an expert in analog synthesizers and it's so cool to see his reaction working with this instrument. He made a variety of the programs as well and he knows his library in and out as well. So I'm gonna quickly hand the musical baton to Shimmy. Hey, my name is Dan Shimalinski. People like to call me Shimmy and you can too. I am a bassist, sound designer, and composer based in Los Angeles, and today we are in my studio where we are going to be taking a deep dive look into the 10 Analog Synths Library. Now this is part of the Epic Ensemble series, and it's one of my personal favorite libraries to work with in Sound and Paint for a multitude of reasons, first and foremost of which is obviously I am a massive analog synthesizer fanatic, and if I had all the time and energy in the world, I would love nothing more than to take 10 of my favorites, fly them to Europe, and sample them all playing different wave shapes in a beautiful orchestral hall in the Czech Republic, but I don't have to because this library is an absolute masterpiece and I'm so excited to share it with you. This library is one of the most useful that you can have in sound paint. Whether you want to create synth specific sounds or you're interested in blending a synth sound with maybe an acoustic instrument to give it a modern or cinematic touch, uh, this is the way to go. It is a broad spectrum of timbral beauty and uh, why am I talking still? Let's just go for it. So I want to start by looking at all of the parts that you get with 10 analog synths. There are 11 and they have simple names that are kind of specific to the wave shapes like saw, sine, square, and then you have a couple here, distorted, strung, uh, warmth. I find them all to be useful and I just kind of want you to hear what each one sounds like before we jump into the programs. Here's distorted. really tasteful, growly, uh, kind of epic cinematic sound there. Almost reminds me of G-Brass a little bit, which you should check out as well. Here's Strung. Very nice string sound. Uh, clearly some different waves happening in there, not just your standard uh, super saw sound. It's really, really nice. Let's check out warmth. You 
can hear the sensitivity, the velocity layers that we all love in sound paint, of course, extend into these synth packs, which is something that a lot of these synths around me cannot do. It's very, very interesting to play sounds I'm familiar with in the synth spectrum, but with such fine control over the velocities. It's really, really fun. Here's the saw. Very, very buzzy. I want to hear what that sounds like compared to the distorted. So it's got a lot more sizzle to it. I love that. Let's check out the staccato version. <laughs> we'll get into this momentarily, but can you clearly see that maybe blending that kind of a sound with like a staccato piano or uh, maybe to just kind of accent the attack of, of a bigger brass instrument would really be useful. Um, and I love that you can kind of hear the little artifact of the trail uh, of this beautiful concert hall where this was sampled. Let's check out the sign. so warm that's just like a big cozy hug i love it i also love that there's just little analog inconsistencies which we as analog synth enthusiasts love i love the little circuitry discrepancies uh the more character the better and these parts all have their own character to them let's check out the staccato version of the sine wave oh yeah So again, much like the other staccato parts, very good for blending, very good to add a little punch, a little roundness, a little warmth to whatever you're trying to do in sound paint. It's awesome. Let's check out the square wave. Very, very present, a nice hollow sound. If you're new to the idea of, of waveforms, this is a great crash course primer on what they all sound like. <laughs> um, you know, saw is definitely gonna be your most buzzy. It's gonna have the most upper harmonic information. Sign is definitely gonna be the smoothest. Uh, square wave kind of has a, a, a hollow or resonant aspect to it. And well, let's check out the square staccato real quick. <laughs> super useful. Um, and then triangle is typically, I have to check it out here, it's typically a buzzier uh, version of the sign. Let's listen. Yeah, let's go back to sign. So we're getting a little more sizzle with the triangle. Awesome, super big, super huge. And the staccato, again, is gonna probably be somewhat similar. Ooh, we got a little bit of a pop to it.
So that's kind of a brief overview of the parts that you get with 10 analog synths. Are you kind of seeing what I'm saying? So now that you have an idea of what each part sounds like, let's jump over to the program side of things and see some of this stuff in action. With 10 analog synths, you get a huge amount of custom designs by sound designers like myself, Trolls, uh, Nicholas Semrad, um, really, really awesome examples of utilizing these parts to their fullest potential when you start combining them with rack effects and all sorts of stuff. So let's go ahead. I've hearted a, <laughs> a couple of my favorites that I want to show you. Um, I'm not a pianist. Piano is not my main instrument, as ironic as that is, as I'm surrounded by keyboards. Um, <laughs> so I will try to do these patches justice. Let's start with this one. This is Analog Stacks by Mr. Trolls. So, so warm, love it. What I really like about this program is how he's merging a staccato sound with a sustain sound. So that's gonna give that little initial plume on the beginning of the note. Bow. You're getting a, a really nice, you're getting a really nice attack there. Um, just a reminder of what it sounds like by itself. And then with the sustain. Very, very tasteful. And then we've got it going through an EQ which I know if you saw me on the mod wheel, but uh, one of Troll's trademark tricks uh, is assigning the mod wheel to one of the bands in an EQ. It's a really easy, effective way to make a sound brighter, kind of growl more. Um, and there we have something around the 8K mark. Very, very cool. Good trick. Let's check out Attack Gate. We just have a uh, saw here with, oh, it looks like a attack of a plastic pipe <laughs> from a percussion pack. Uh, and that's utilizing the gate, which you can find in your effects section. The gate is just a dream to work with. You just kind of draw out, it's very clean. Personally, if this were my program, I would maybe uh, assign the mod wheel uh, to the mix to make it a little bit harder on the uh, attack effect. Well, let's do it. And it's just that easy. Just a quick right click, assign to a MIDI CC, and now... And let's get that release down. I like to get it choppy. I like it choppy. I like my gates choppy. Awesome. Check out Epic Pad. Now, when you have programs that involve two different libraries, they will only appear uh, when you acquire those libraries. So, for example, in this Epic Pad, we have some combo noise hiss um, from a different synth library. So, uh, if you did not have that library, this gem would not appear in the program section. Uh, but I do, and I'm glad I do because it is a very nice pad. Let's check it out. epic <laughs> definitely the most epic and all we have on the mod wheel is going to the cutoff of the filter always a tasteful choice check this guy out hast du hast de 
du hast asked? I don't know. We'll find out together. Oh, we have our first mono <laughs> program. Yes, mono is on. So this is going to be a awesome lead. That's insane. What do we have going on here? I definitely heard an LFO to something to the frequency of the chorus. Very cool trick. So in Sound Paint, you can very quickly uh, assign an LFO to just about any parameter, just how you would do with MIDI CC. Just right click, add LFO automation, and here we have an LFO going to the frequency of a chorus. What a neat trick. Very, very cool. And uh, Mod Wheel definitely brought in some added distortion. Making this one nasty lead. Let's check out Pad Pulse. This is by Mr. Nicholas Semrad, one of my... Let's check out Pad Pulse. This is done by Mr. Nicholas Semrad, one of my personal uh, synth sound design heroes. And it looks pretty simple at first glance here. We just have one... Uh, part of the strung pad uh, through an analog filter and a chorus. Um, oh, but that is not simple. Whoa. So as I was saying before, you can assign an LFO to just about any parameter. Nick Semrad has done a ramp LFO to the feedback of <laughs> the chorus unit. Let's check this out. is awesome. I never would have thought to do that. Kind of just milking that feedback to give a pulse to a pad. Very, very neat. This one's called Warmth Faded Glitter. Another Nicholas Semrad program. Check out this one called Thinker's Arp. As with everything in Sound Paint, the Arp is super intuitive and easy to use. Let's go ahead and put a hold on and see what this one sounds like. Beautiful, just beautiful. Let's check out Warbled. We're really in lo-fi zone here. I love it. <laughs> We got some high pass action, I think, happening on the mod wheel. Yes, the filter analog is my personal favorite uh, filter just because it's got so many different options. You've got high pass, band pass, band reject, low shelf, high shelf, parametric, and of course, low pass. And all of these come with their own set of presets. I actually had the honor of creating these presets, so 
check them out. They change as you change your filter type. Triangle Majestic Opener. Oh, great. Let's try that. Seems simple up front. Just one layer of triangle, but some cool effects happening here. Let's see. Love the shimmer reverb tremo verb whoa <laughs> look, look at that two instances of shimmer reverb uh both with a very fast lfo that's crazy going into a third reverb uh and then into a digital delay which looks like it comes in when you move the mod wheel <laughs> hearing that both of these I think have different pitch shifts yeah ah oh, what a neat trick let's close out with a warm pad from our favorite designer trolls oh cool very nice and I'm sure we will see the EQ trick here yes love it nice warm pad we're going with the warmth through an EQ compressor which is toggled off so that's optional as well as a gate through a Lexi reverb <laughs> So now that we've gone through a small portion of the programs available to you, and I do mean small portion, there are like 60 here. You can see I just kind of picked out my favorites. Let's try and make a program from scratch. And I think you've heard a lot of pads, you've heard a lot of, uh, of, of lush sounds, and I kind of want to stay in that ballpark. But let's try and make a really dope string patch and I want to create it in a way that allows it to almost feel like an organic uh, symphony sound where we can actually control the dynamics and intensity of vibrato uh, with the movement of just the mod wheel and so I'm gonna go up here and create a new program clear out and head back to our parts tab what do I use as my base for a string pad let's start with strung that's a good idea <laughs> Let's go ahead and add an envelope to this sound so we can get more of a dynamic uh, attack and decay situation happening. Let's do maybe a one and a half second attack, uh, maybe a two and a half second decay. And just, I like to slide the multiplier here down just, just ever so slightly and then a good bit of release. And already just adding a ADSR envelope uh, to this amazing uh, part gives us more of a realistic string sound. Hopefully, let's see.
that sounds <laughs> pretty stringy to me. So much of treatment and tone shaping when it comes to synthesis is really just adding a lot of little subtle changes and subtle motion to make it feel uh, as alive as possible. So um, I think I'd like to maybe have vibrato uh, going to the micro tuning. Um, so I'm gonna do that by right clicking and adding LFO automation. We're gonna change the bias to center get sync off we like to kind of choose our hertz here and this is a very wide range obviously but let's try 40 and 40. let's see what that sounds like depends if you're going for the synth vibrato string sound which that would be totally applicable but uh let's rein it in just ever so slightly Try 22% on either side. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna assign my mod wheel to both the amount of this LFO and the frequency of it. So that when I crescendo, I'm creating this kind of crescendo sound, the vibrato gets faster um, and the uh, vibrato actually gets wider. So I'm gonna right click on amount add CC automation, move my mod wheel to get it to click over to CC1. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with just a, just a touch of vibrato, maybe 0.15 or something like that. And let's see what that motion sounds like before we even touch changing the frequency. like that a lot. And our frequency is kind of right dead in the center here, around four. Let's go ahead and add MIDI CC automation to the frequency. And I'm gonna have it start right around where we had it. And this does not need to be that extreme. bit slower to start and not as high of a frequency. Nice. So now, if you're keeping score at home, we have uh, CC1 controlling uh, the amount and the frequency of our um, pitch here, the micro tuning. So where else can we go from here? Well, adding a second part would maybe be uh, a logical place to go. I'm almost curious if we just do the naked saw here and let's kind of mimic the same sort of envelope action happening. Uh, but it's also nice to have two slightly different envelopes just so that the motion doesn't sound um, identical. Again, this is something that you can do super, super easy. So let's have it be a slightly longer attack um, maybe a longer decay as well and have the multiplier down a little more and then where was that release at? It's around two seconds. Let's do pretty close to the same. And I just want to blend this layer in. Uh, I don't want it to be at the same volume level so I'll bring this guy down just a touch. sounding really, really nice. Let's go ahead and put it through a Lexi reverb. All right. Let's see what um, big bright hall sounds like. I know I'm gonna wanna goose it a little bit more than that. Nice. Now I wanna add another element to kind of grow with that mod wheel motion. Um, it would be very, very cool if I could do something that kind of brightens and darkens the sound, right? Because, you know, as a violinist or any string player is kind of leaning into it, um, the pitch will start darker naturally and get a little more grisly as we go. So a great way to do that would just be to, you could do it either through, um, <laughs> you can do the trolls trick, which is to grab an EQ, and maybe do a 
uh, high shelf up here and then automate this guy up and down. That would certainly work. Like that. Or you could do it through uh, a low pass filter. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with trolls method here because I really do like it quite a bit. We're gonna add MIDI CC automation to it and bring it from maybe there to pretty far up there. Let's see what that sounds like. I want to touch on something that we really haven't talked about yet, which is the morph section between parts. And one principle of analog synth sound creation that I really enjoy is having a synth with a uh, variable wave shape. So in other words, it's not necessarily just saw, uh, pulse, triangle, square. You can actually mix between the two and kind of get these hybrid in between uh, wave shapes. And I want to kind of discuss how to do that in sound paint in two different ways. <laughs> the first way is actually using this morph tool. So uh, let's load up just the uh, naked saw sound. And then in part two, let's say, let's try a square. Just to remind you what each sounds like, that's square. And this is saw. Now, if we use the morph tool, we can kind of sort of create a wave mixing effect. Um, I have uh, gotten various results using this technique, um, but it actually allows you to get some really interesting, unique sounds that you might not get to on the surface level with these parts. Um, I want to look at what it looks like when we are morphing the square into the saw. So this isn't actually mixing. We'll get into that in a second. You're not mixing between. You are having the square exist within the saw. And I would love to see what this looks like on an oscilloscope. Um, but let's check it out. I'm going to just slowly bring up the morph slider uh, and we'll be listening to the square inside of the saw. That's pretty cool. It's nice and buzzy and alive, right in that 60, like the 65 to 75. I like that a lot. Let's hear the other direction. I think I prefer the other way. But one thing that you can do is you can actually assign an LFO to that morph slider. So let's say we want it to kind of dance around that, uh, that area that we were talking about, nice and slow. If you've got that just slowly panning as you're creating some like evolving pad, uh, that's gonna do wonders. something to experiment with, but let's go for a literal uh, one knob mix function here to try and see what it would sound like uh, if we had a variable wave knob. So let's clear out here and do the same thing. So, 
and square. And this is a trick I came up with. Um, well, I can't. I'm sure others have come up with it too. Uh, a trick I discovered very early on when sound designing uh, for sound paint, which is this reverse behavior toggle is world changing. For me, I like to assign it to very basic things like uh, part one volume. So let's say we want to start from zero to all the way down, reverse behavior to our mod wheel. Now what you'll notice this does, I'm going to turn off part two for a second. When the mod wheel is down, part one is uh, the zero point for volume. And as I bring up the mod wheel, the volume decreases. I think you can see where I'm going with this. So a great way to get this kind of variable wave shape sound is to do the same thing to the other wave, the same exact setup, but don't use reverse behavior. And now you are with one knob fading between the two different wave shapes. Kind of a cool trick. Uh, I'm all about trying to recreate actual analog synth effects in sound paint. I've mentioned it a couple times throughout this demonstration, but one of the very coolest things to do is to take a 10 analog synth part and mesh it with a completely different, often sounds the coolest with acoustic instruments, uh, library. So let's go ahead and just try maybe a sine staccato here. And uh, just for demonstration's sake, because I know you all have it, and that would be the 1928 Grand. I have overshot it. There it is. Let's choose the uh, staccato as well and just hear what a synth sounds like with a piano library. <laughs> even make the volume a little more extreme. I like mostly synth anyways. Very cool. Very nice sound. Uh, it's even cooler if you have a sustain layer because that's going to uh, give that initial push. Kind of the same thing we talked about with Trolls Patch uh, when we looked at the program called uh, Analog Stacks, something like that. But if you have kind of a punchier synth sound uh, integrated into a sustaining sound, that's a really cool effect and it just gives a little, little push to the beginning of the sample. <laughs> This has been a look at the 10 Analog Synths library. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, you know, I'm still exploring new things with this library. I've had it for over a year now, and um, I'm finding that the utilizations for these core parts are endless. And um, I really, really hope you get it. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you make beautiful instruments, music, compositions, what have you. And, uh, yeah, this is Dan Shimolinski or Shimmy, signing out, and uh, see you next time. <laughs>